Good morning, everybody. I will talk uh, a little bit about wildfires as well as about uh, biogenic emissions based on uh, some experiments that we have done in recent years. All of these were done over North America, and I'll tell you a little bit about them. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge many, many people. I'm just calling it the science teams of these two big experiments. Uh, as you'll see, there were many, many people involved, so I didn't name them individually, but their contributions are recognized and very important. Uh, I don't think you need to worry about uh, what the, these acronyms stand for, but just remember that the Seekers is pretty much over the continent. United States and Arctas is the part I'm discussing would be over the boreal forest over Canada. Uh, because these experiments are very complex, I'm only going, they had many, many elements like cloud physics and uh, cloud aerosol interactions and radiation and stratosphere. I will only limit my uh, talk to a few things and first of all, give you a brief introduction. I'll talk about a little bit about wildfire and agricultural emissions and how they, how, what their evolution is in time and uh, how they change and produce various things. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some simulations we've done when these fire emissions interact with uh, with urban pollution. And last but last night, we heard many, many talks uh, in, in this conference about uh, the issue of formaldehyde and how we can invert it into getting isoprene uh, emissions. And I'll have some comment on the constraints that exist on, uh, on that process uh, before we go too forward with modeling exercises. Uh, once again, my talk is, lim uh, we had many aircraft, but I will limit it to the DC-8, and uh, we had some 28 different instruments on it, measuring a variety of tracers, uh, photochemical products and precursors, greenhouse gases, aerosol composition, aerosol properties, as well as radiation. So uh, the bottom line is that we are making a very large number, a comprehensive number of uh, uh, in-situ measurements on this platform. We also have some remote sensors having to do with radiation, but also a LIDAR that can make measurements both above the aircraft as well as uh, below the aircraft. Uh, as you all know, fires are uh, increasing. This is the upper aircraft. Upper graph is from Canada where they're trying to relate the increase in the acreage burnt over Canada. Uh, as a function of temperature and global warming, and also in California, we are seeing a very increased frequency of uh, fires, uh, whether this is due to drought conditions or is associated with some sort of a warming. But I think there's general belief that there will be more fires uh, in, the, in the coming years. This is a brief description of the uh, two experiments. The Arctas experiment is this, this region burns every year and there is a lot of fires. These are the boreal fires and we specifically went there to, to investigate them in 2008. And then in 2012, we did a seekers mission, which, uh, which did two things. One is looked at this southeast US region, particularly focused on biogenic emissions, but also we, we encountered some major fires during that time, and we investigated, we investigated those, uh, those in great detail. So I'll show a little bit of data on what these fires looked like, how they compared with, uh, with these uh, other fires in the boreal area, and uh, what we do and don't know about these things. Uh, the first question you ask yourself is when you're over continental United States is, uh, is you know, you've got fires, you've got pollution, you've got everything else under the sun, so how do you really uh, untangle the, the measurements that you make? So we, we really heavily depend on a bunch of tracers. We have biomass burning tracers, we have anthropogenic tracers, and a number of uh, other things that we can use to tell one species or one source from another. There's an example of a CO2 
If you see the CO2 versus CO graph, and you can see when we are we are in uh, in Canada in fires, the graph the, this relationship goes like that. When we are in an urban area, this relationship goes like that. Similarly, here, if you see a plot of CO and methane, we can really tell distinct signs of where it's biogenic, where it's and you know urban, and where it's, it's biomass burning emission. So, so we are able to tell a lot by looking at not only these traces that we measure, but also by the relationship. Uh, I, I will focus mostly on gases, but also aerosols are very important. Here you see, in, uh, for example, organic aerosol in the green here, and you can see that it's very large in uh, biomass burning. This is delta organic aerosols over delta CO, and you can see it's in transported pollution, it's less, and in urban it's even more or less, and sulfates is going the other way around. So by looking at relationship among these uh, these various aerosols and gaseous traces, we can tell uh, quite a bit about the sources uh, of what we are measuring. Uh, the first thing we do is, uh, is, is, is get the background over the atmosphere because this is a changing phenomenon. So, so the, this, this background of a variety of species, as you see here, is for cases where there was no anthropogenic pollution. So in other words, things like CO and all were very low. You can see the, the uh, profiles will tell you methane is essentially straight all the way up to 12 kilometers. CO2 is straight. Some other species like methanol are showing some trends and we know that there are biogenic uh, or other sources on the ground that are unrelated with pollution. So when you see in the next few graphs something called a delta, that's delta is over these backgrounds. So at each level, these backgrounds were calculated from these observations and then something was subtracted from there. Uh, this is a, a major fire that occurred in 2013. It's called the Rim Fire. It, uh it, it lasted more than two weeks, and at the end, about 300,000 acres were burned. So we were doing uh, an experiment at that time, so we had the opportunity to go and study it. We had another aircraft that was able to study it a little bit later. So this was, uh, this was a big fire. You can see some satellite information here, and we, we, we essentially followed some of these uh, fire emissions over a two to three day period. Uh, you can also see some LiDAR pictures which clearly show the emissions uh, underlying these things. But I also want to mention that these are what's called the big wildfires where there is a lot of emissions and a lot of attention is paid to them. There are efforts going on to extinguish these things. But there's also these smaller fires in there and these are, a lot of these are agricultural fires and we sampled quite a few of the agricultural fires. They are very different but they also are more numerous so around the globe actually agricultural fires, carbon burned fork seeds, uh, wildfire, even the wildfires get a lot of attention. Uh, so one of the typical things that we are finding uh, in these fires is that the chemicals are, are released in, in very strange ways. There is no simple emission factor you can, you can define because it depends on, you can take the same type of uh, combustion process, same conifers, they, these are all conifers basically, uh, but they're very much dependent on the type of fire, how hot it is, whether it's, it's a, a smoldering. And this is an example of a tracer itself we use which is acetonitrate, uh, Ian Galvelli talked about it in the background atmosphere. But if you look at fire, this is flaming in this region and then slowly going to smoldering in that region, you see that huge change in emissions uh, that is taking place. It's a highly nonlinear process. However, other gases are changing as well. So if you plot uh, uh, CO versus CH3, they're still, they're still following in a, in a line. So there, is, there are some basic relationships uh, that are maintained even though uh, things are changing rapidly with the type of fire and, uh, and, the, and really the, the nature of combustion. Uh, 
So this is uh, one of the things that we were very interested in is, is methane emissions coming from these fires. And uh, as you can see here, both these aircrafts, uh, one, is, one is an AMC aircraft, it's called the Alpha Jet, went in there also. The DC-8 went in there in the dark blue line. And although the DC-8 saw a much greater delta CO, uh, these, the slope of this line in the two experiments, uh, so we were there in, uh, uh, in 2016 6th and 27th August, and the Alpha Jet went there on the 29th August, but this is nearly identical. So as the fire was burning hot, the, the slopes were very much identical, so, so we can really get an idea of uh, what the, the methane uh, relationship is to, to CO2 in this case. But 10 days later, the slope had changed dramatically, and so, so now it's here. So you're getting much more methane burnt once the air had, uh, once the, the fire had cooled down a little bit. And this is, this is indicated here in these graphs where the blue line is here, and then 10 days later, we are here. Uh, this, this kind of phenomenon seems to be uh, applying to all kinds of uh, other traces as well, other gases as well. And uh, uh, so I'm just giving examples of ethane, toluene, methane, what, what have you, all doing the same thing. As the fire gets a little bit cooler, you get more emissions than as it gets really hot. This is a comparison of uh, uh, fires in the boreal region and uh, in the in the in the continental U.S. region, and this is. I'm just taking examples of two species, acetone and uh, methanol, and as a function of acetonitrile. And you can see that uh, they are significantly different, at least by factors of two and so on. So this is uh, largely, if you plot them as a function of, uh, of sort of the combustion efficiency, they seem to both follow on the same line. But you see more, more uh, uh, green, uh, signs here, which is octas than red sign. So, so the reason for this probably is that that those fires really ran much hotter for for a longer period of time than than these fires. So we have much more emission of these species in the secrets campaign than we did uh, than we did in the. Uh, Octas campaign, but fundamentally their characteristics are similar. Uh, however, it depends on how the, the burning takes place. Uh, some comments about uh, agricultural fires. So agriculture fires were, had many of the same features, but there were some differences. We saw lots of SO2 coming out of agriculture fires, much more than in the wildfires. Uh, however, even though it looks a lot, if you, if you add it all up, it's still uh, about 1% of fossil fuel of sulfur, but indeed there's a lot of sulfur coming out of uh, these fires. Uh, similarly, there's a difference in, uh, in uh, for example, PAN, which is proxy acetyl nitrate as a function of the total reactive nitrogen, much higher in wildfires compared with agricultural fires. There was also hydrogen chloride coming in, in these agricultural fires, and that was about 15 times larger than, uh, uh, larger than in wildfires. So these, these small fires contribute a lot of different things, and there's a lot of them. And we, we have sampled some of them uh, to get an idea of what the differences are. Uh, so what happens to these fires once they, once they, you know, are transported over a couple of days in the atmosphere after release? So this experiment, we were able to sample them over at least two to three day time period. So this is a plot of, uh, of uh, it's going over, it's, it's a plot of delta, let's say delta ozone over delta CO, so we can, by doing delta C ratios, we can uh, remove the dilution effects that are taking place. Uh, so initially, for very short, fresh fires, there is virtually no ozone formation, and at the end of these fires, in about two to three days, we are getting a delta O3 over delta uh, CO of about 0.1. This is, uh, the red line is what we see in the boreal fires, and the black line is what we are seeing here in the continental fires. So pretty much the same. Uh, so the question, 
we don't have direct answer for what happens after that, after two or three days, and these may continue to go up. But one of the things that is happening is initially, the fires have a lot of knocks, but it's very rapidly depleting, and it's getting converted into things like Proxyacetyl nitrate, which are more stable species. In the after, beyond this point, the NOx uh, will probably be controlled by the pan that has been produced as sort of a reservoir <laughs> species, and so this may go up some, but probably not a lot. So this kind of limits the amount of ozone that uh, that is produced uh, in these in these uh, plumes. Oh, okay. Uh, so this is an example of uh, of uh, uh, the the very early times where the you can see the pans are getting formed very very quickly. This is an example of an agricultural fire. Uh, uh, for organic aerosols, I won't go into it, but uh, uh, but there is indication. Ouch, there is indication that there is some formation going on towards the end. I will. Uh, I will basically, uh, since my time is running up, say a few words about the formaldehyde situation. So we measured all of the formaldehyde products. Uh, there, there is a whole scheme for isoprene uh, oxidation. Uh, the, uh, the main theme here is that when you have in the high NOx conditions, you are producing formaldehyde, and when you're in low NOx condition, you're producing aerosols. The question then is whether you can take this and back calculate uh, isoprene, because you can measure formaldehyde through satellites, and, uh, and there, there are some issues. There's, the good news is that when you have in a high NOx environment, there are several products. In this case, these are the isoprene nitrates, very nicely correlated with formaldehyde. Uh, formaldehyde is also well correlated with methylvinyl ketone, methacrylene, uh, and some of the intermediate products like uh, isoprene epoxides are correlated with organic aerosols, but going from there to there is, is still not possible. Uh, however, there are some really difficult intermediates in between. Okay, so, so basically we, the, uh, the hydroxyl radical situation is very bad, so until these things get, get sorted out, uh, it won't be, it's not simple to go from here to there. Uh, having said that, I'll just uh, end this and just simply say that we have lots of data, there'll be some presentations at the AGU, and these data are available to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much.